Ophelia Wade and uh, Roy Lister are going to co-chair this session and Ophelia will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. What a privilege to be here today and how privileged we are to have as our closing plenary Dr. Patsy Lightbound. I hope I can do you justice in this introduction. Dr. Patsy Lie Brown is a distinguished professor emerita of applied linguistics from the University of Concordia and Montreal. For more than 35 years, she has studied how different types of input and instruction, how time in the language, and how form-focused and language-focused activities affect second language acquisition. She has particularly focused on examining these effects in classrooms that are characterized as communicative classrooms or content-based classrooms. The context of her research has included the teaching of English as a second langu a language for French-speaking students in Canada as well as dual language or two-way immersion classes in the US. Her excellence in research, academic writing, and teaching have been hallmark through prestigious recognitions and awards. She is the recipient of the Distinguished Professor Emerita of Concordia University Award. She is also the recipient of the University of Concordia University Alumni Association Award for Excellence in Teaching. Her most recent book, Focus on Content-Based Language Teaching, has been the runner-up for the British Council Award of ELT Writing, whereas her seminal book, How Languages Are Learned, was awarded the first prize in the English Speaking Union's Duke of Edinburgh Book Prize in the Applied Linguistics category, an award that she received at Buckingham Palace by Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Over the past three decades, Dr. Lightbound has been a prolific contributor to the body of second language acquisition literature with 48 published articles in refereed publications, seven books, 14 book chapters, and eight research reports. I don't know when she sleeps. Her research and writing have shaped the professional preparation of literally every student in the field of second language acquisition. She has, in addition, informed and inspired innumerable practitioners through countless lectures, seminars, workshops, and short courses. I am confident, Patsy, that I speak on behalf of all the SL students and practitioners in saying that today I feel starstruck and honor to personally and publicly thank you for being our insightful teacher who has deepened our understanding of second language acquisition and teaching, for shaping our practice through that understanding, for being our co-teacher in the university classrooms where your textbooks are our constant references. Yes. Your work has become a perpetual legacy through the many professional careers that you continue to inform and shape. What is equally impressive to me, Dr. Lightbound, is that your significant contributions extend beyond the scope of our professional world to that of our society through the legacy, and I quote, of your eight lovely grandchildren, each becoming at least bilingual and each learning his or her languages under different conditions, a veritable research laboratory. 
please welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Patsy Lightbound. Wow. I was expecting to look out and see three tables in the front and a few little people in the back. Thank you all for being here. My, that is, I, I'm, I'm really touched and, and moved because I know what those airline schedules are like and how you are, you probably are all sitting with your suitcases beside you and all that. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ophelia, for that um, uh, very, um, I could get a large head, I think. If I, it's a good thing I wasn't wearing a hat, because I think if my head would have grown a couple of sizes. Uh, thank you to Dee and Roy and the planning committee members for inviting me and making the end to Karen and for the others, the staff of Carla, who've made the arrangements for this conference so seamless and, and delightful and fun. Um, I cannot thank you enough for what you're doing at Carla. For, not only for language learning and teaching research, but also, and above all, now for professional development. What you're doing in the areas of professional development is so impressive and so important. And we've been looking, we've been waiting for years to see this come to fruition. And your work and the work that Roy's doing and a number of other people whose papers and workshops I've attended tell me that once, finally, we're starting to bring the research and teaching together in ways that we haven't been able to do um, in all contexts, and I'll have a lot more to say about that. I certainly am um, honored and, oops, now, here we go, here we go. <laughs> honored and, and humbled, too, because um, I've been given a place uh, among um, an, an exceptional group of keynote speakers. I've attended some wonderful uh, sessions, um, and. I am determined to get that cursor back over here. Okay, um, But of course, I'm also uh, humbled by the um, participation of the people that we know are the real experts, which is to say so many classroom teachers. I am, uh, I'm, I'm always as astonished and delighted when I see teachers who find the time and whose schools and school boards and school districts find the means to support them for this kind of professional development activity. It's, it's very sad um, that, that, that you represent a small percentage of those who could benefit from this kind of event, but I am grateful, and I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would see a conference on foreign language immersion and indigenous language immersion and dual immersion in the United States with a thousand people participating. I never imagined that I would see that. <laughs> So let me tell you how I came to that uh, astonishing, how, to, how I got here. Um, in the 1960s, I was a teacher of French as a foreign language in a high school where, um, as was the custom of the time, only the academically gifted students were allowed to, teach, to study a foreign language. Um, and and even, uh, even they tended to be selected very carefully because it was considered something of a a special aptitude and special ability, and a lot of students who were quite strong in other subjects would avoid the foreign language uh, subjects unless they were required. Um, and uh, along the way, for personal reasons, I ended up uh, leaving that profession, but one of the things that, I, that happened before I left that uh, teaching high school French profession was that I became aware that my, a colleague of mine whose classroom was in another wing of the school was teaching something called ESL to uh, students from all over the place who apparently were all gifted academically and brilliant because they were supposed to learn English in about a year and then be integrated fully into their real education, which was English. And I thought, Gee, that's amazing. Let's find out how they do that. Um, so when I moved uh, to Columbia University as a graduate student, I started out in TESOL and ESL, and I was headed for um, that career. And then I got really bitten by the bilingual education bug. I thought, this, this is really great. Bilingual education, now that is something interesting. 
And I went to a conference in Chicago in 1971 where I met, among others, Meryl Swain, Dick Tucker, um, se several others whose names I wrote down, but you'll, you'll get the picture that this was a, a, an amazing moment. I, it's also the first time I ever heard, I, I, this is a confession, first time I ever heard anybody say A at the end of a sentence. That's, that's my first memory of Meryl Swain. And I thought, why does she do that? <laughs> Um, but the conference was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It was inspirational. Uh, it, it, was made, it was people from Canada and the U.S. and also internationally who believed in bilingualism in childhood and believed in bilingual education. And I just thought, boy, this is where we're going. This is where it's going to happen. And I was ready to really hit the road, you know, running with them. And uh, so I continued my studies. And then I had another epiphany, another bug got me. I discovered early childhood language acquisition, and I thought that was really interesting. And it was partly because I was thinking about starting my own family, and I thought, well, that would be a good thing to know about when you're going to have kids. That was part of it. But I think also it was just an inspirational professor who got me so hooked on the idea of studying child language that I kind of changed my focus for a while. And when the opportunity came for me to go to Montreal, to study early childhood bilingualism and early childhood uh, bilingual education, um, I decided I would go to Montreal for a year or two and get the data for my dissertation and then go back to New York and finish the work. And I, in the end, I only stayed for 27 years, so, so it wasn't that much different from what I had planned. But what happened when I got to, um, when I got to Montreal was that I found that my students who were mostly people who were preparing to teach English in the Quebec school system. And so in the end, uh, I say my students because I forgot to mention the part where, this is actually funny too, oh, I'm, I'm worse than Donald Trump, believe me, when I don't have a teleprompter, I can go anywhere. <laughs> but I don't say mean things, I don't say mean things. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to stay focused here. But, but I forgot to mention the part where I got a job, and I remember that I was offered the job at Concordia University to teach a course called Language Acquisition in a TESOL teacher training program. And I thought, I have no idea how to do that. How would you, what, what, could you, what is the material that you would teach? What do we know about that? And in, at that time, what we knew about that was a little bit about child language, child second language, child bilingualism, we had a few studies from California uh, about um, uninstructed adults learning language, and then we had some, some serious uh, uh, looks at, uh, at early childhood bilingualism and some things coming out of the bilingual education literature. Um, but really, to teach a course in language acquisition, I, 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 where would I start? So to make a rather long story, just a little bit longer, um, <laughs> I, I, I did turn my attention to uh, looking at language acquisition in the classroom, because I realized finally that even if I knew about early childhood development, even if I knew about what was happening with adults in California, even if I knew about bilingual education in a general way, what my students wanted to know about was how do I teach English to Francophone students who are getting an hour a couple of times a week of English? We'll come to that in a moment. Um, so I spent the next... Mm, 30 years, most almost 30 years, focusing on the learning of English as a second language in the French language schools of Quebec. Um, my Canadian colleagues will back me up when I say there's plenty of strange and wonderful stuff we could tell you about language education in Canada. Um, we have just as many crazy things happening as, uh, as have happened in other places, but fundamentally, Canada was a place where language education became important, and for some of the reasons that we've seen um, at this conference and for some of the uh, reasons that people have explained to you, uh, Canada's dual language, um, le its legal status as a dual language country uh, has made it such that there's been strong support for education that allows almost all children to learn at least uh, one other language besides their, their mother tongue. So uh, although I didn't work directly in immersion, uh, during most of that time. Over the years, while I lived and worked in Quebec, um, the groundbreaking research on French immersion that was happening at OISE and at McGill, all of that was right there, you know, always right beside me, and so it was always an important 
professional uh, development part for me. Um, for family reasons, I left Quebec, um, and everywhere I go, people see me with my name tag that says Montreal, but I haven't actually lived in Montreal for um, almost 15 years. Um, and it seems impossible. It seems like last week, you know, it just, the time goes by so fast. But it was for family reasons that I left, and it, that, it is for that reason that in 2002, I happened to be living and voting in Massachusetts when Massachusetts brought out a ballot question to end bilingual education in Massachusetts. And since I hadn't been back in the US of A terribly long at that point, I thought, that's ridiculous. Nobody's going to vote against bilingual education. I mean, I knew that there were political wins, but I, I didn't really think they were that ugly. And I was absolutely stunned when 70% of the voters voted against continuing bilingual education. Um, now, in fairness, uh, educators in Massachusetts have, have, have done the best they can with what they were given. And of course, I'm, I'm excited to know that California is looking like it's going to bring back um, bilingual education. And, and there are some, some happy signs. And my, my personal uh, sadness on that day in 2002 is partly mitigated by the fact that I had already begun working with uh, a dual immersion program in, a, in some schools in Connecticut. Um, and those schools gave me reason to hope that there was a future, um, if not right away in Massachusetts, but at least I could see what a model could be going forward, um, a, a model where uh, children's, both of a child's languages are respected, where in the corridors of the school, um, uh, teachers and students enacted bilingualism on a daily basis, showing respect for each other, showing showing acceptance of each other in ways that um, made me, gave, gave me hope, gave me hope. Um, so I, I'm, I'm excited that there is, um, there is some evidence to, uh, to quote a recent Nobel laureate from Minnesota. I think the times they are changing. <laughs> and I think that we see that this, the, this conference is the best evidence, I think, uh, of that fact. So, let me move to um, the, the, the idea that, that prompted me to uh, talk about what I'm talking about today, besides all the digressions, which I can't seem to manage to control. Um, the idea came to me as uh, Nina Spada and I were working on uh, a presentation about bridging the gap between research and teaching uh, uh, with, and, uh, for second language uh, teaching and, and, and learning. And the more we looked at the relationship between um, research and teaching, the more we felt the power of research that is grounded deeply in local studies. Um, and and I, at one point, I was making lists of, of examples of that. And it just terrified me, because I didn't want to start a list that was going to end up leaving out important people. But let me just say, um, that as far as I'm concerned, the really good research on language learning and, and classroom language learning in particular is done by those people who, who get deep into the community, who understand the, the schools, who understand the teachers, who understand the families, um, and who spend a lot of time uh, in the classroom uh, uh, participating with, with the teachers and the students um, in, in their learning and, and observing their learning and, and getting involved. In our work in Quebec, we never really felt that great gap between research and teaching, and it was partly because we were doing our research in the classrooms where our student teachers were doing their student teaching practice. So early on, we got involved in professional development, trying to take what we learned from our classroom-based research and apply it um, to uh, activities that we did in professional development uh, at teachers, uh, teachers' meetings or workshops. Um, we worked very closely with the Ministry of Education as well, and we were fortunate that some of the people at the ministry were very interested in and attentive to the kinds of things we were finding, particularly with regard to intensive ESL, which I'm sure many of you are aware is kind of the thing that I spent the most time working on 
intensive ESL is not a content-based approach to language teaching because in Quebec it is not legal to teach content other than English in any language other than French. Did that, did that, did that come clear? Um, so if, if you're going to teach English uh, intensively, all you can do is spend more hours teaching English. And of course, that, has, that was interpreted in a great variety of ways. But it was also the case that the, the approach to English language teaching that was um, mandated by the Ministry of Education was a communicative approach to language teaching. So while the approach was not content-based, it was, it was um, focused on meaning rather than focused on language itself, which was a great improvement from the way language was taught when I first got to Quebec, which was a rigid audiolingual approach. But on the other hand, it was, it, we found, of course, that it had its own limitations. And over time, we, um, we, we, work, we tried to work with teachers to get them to um, include some focus on language as well as focus on meaning in their classrooms. And um, we also um, developed, because you know, th there's a limit to the number of workshops uh, university faculty can do out in the community, or um, as they say in Quebec, en région, you know, out in the, out in the countryside. Um, so we, um, what we, we were asked to create a set of modules that could be sort of self-instructive, or at least could be uh, guided by a, a person who would be the local uh, conseiller pedagogique, somebody who had some knowledge, who had lots of knowledge of teaching, but had not any experience or background in second language acquisition studies. So it was that series of modules that became how languages are learned. Um, so again, even though how languages are learned has now become, as Ophelia was kind enough to say, a, a widely used uh, text, it started out as very, very local. It started out being a, a set of materials for Quebec teachers in the regions. And I still have a letter from the Oxford University Press uh, commissioning editor who, who thought it was a nice manuscript, but she couldn't see if it would, she wasn't sure it would have any relevance to people in other places. So we, we feel very um, rewarded that people have found it. But that, I think that's maybe at the heart of my feeling that what is what is really in some ways most applicable or most relevant, I'll use a better word, is, is that which is understood deeply in one place, and then other people can look at it and say, well, I understand that, and let me, let me see what it is in my situation. Um, and um, so it, it, How Languages Are Learned is not a methods book. It's not a book that tells people exactly what they should be doing, but it gives them a set of expectations or a set of... Um, uh, some, some knowledge and information that they can, that they can test out in their own circumstances. Uh, okay. Um, even even with that, that being said, even though I feel that we've uh, been fortunate to have um, um, been able to take what we did very locally and spread it to a, a larger audience, it's still the case that the idea of research and teaching as um, somehow in, uh, incompatible uh, remains uh, a problem. We, we still hear people talk about the gap between research and teaching. Um, here's an example from an article by Simon Borg. In my own context, he's quoting a teacher, almost nobody reads research publications. Teachers don't have time. There's a huge gap between research and practice in the US. In addition to any skepticism that teachers may express, they will also say, above all, that, they, that time is the biggest impediment. Um, Rosemary Erlam's uh, article has a wonderful title, I think, and I can just hear her saying it in her New Zealandish. Um, what do you researchers know about language teaching? Um, and I especially like this article because, in fact, she does in that article, in that research that's reported in that article, bridge the gap between SLA research and language pedagogy in a very uh, creative way. Um, in SSLA and language learning from 1990 to 2010, so-called lab studies outnumbered classroom studies by three to one. That kind of statistic will, will immediately set teachers to wondering whether what's being published has anything to do with them. Um, but if we look now at the, at the 
new journals um, that are coming out, we can no longer argue that there isn't a, um, a, a large number of classroom-based studies that teachers can look to um, for uh, insights into language learning in different environments. That being said, um, no matter how diligently researchers work to include all the variables that teachers work with in a typical day, the data they collect and the con conclusions they draw are by necessity less complex than the reality that teachers confront every day. No study can, can get it all, and in fact, Clark goes on to say later in that article, that in a study that he did of um, 30, 39 teachers, he pretty much concluded that there were 39 research, uh, teaching methods represented by those 39 teachers. Um, Collins and Marsden observed correctly that not all phenomena of interest have been examined in the real world complexity of classrooms, and even those that have are obviously constrained in generalizability by the particular context in which they were investigated. And, in, and that's borne out by another uh, comment, which is that the problem with research is the assumption that knowledge can be transferred from the research context to a particular classroom. So never mind that it's classroom-based research. If it's not my classroom, I'm not sure that it can be translated to my classroom. And that's a, there's legitimacy in that perspective because it, you know, 39 teachers, 39 methods, and 39 teachers with 39 classes. I can't multiply 39 times 39, but I think you know what I mean. Every class is different. Every year is different. So um, it's, it's, it's sometimes frustrating to think that we can say anything at all uh, from the research that will be relevant to the teachers who were not involved in the classroom where the work was done. But, but we have to. You know, we want to. We must, we must try. Um, because we have new teachers coming along who would like to, have to benefit from the wisdom of the past. And we also have um, uh, in-service teachers who are interested in improving their practice and are looking to, to research as one um, of the tools uh, that they can use to improve their own practice. So research is one source for understanding and insight into what works and what doesn't in the classroom. Uh, it is certainly not the only source. It is not necessarily even the best source. Um, but it is still a valuable source, and it, for that reason, it's worth it to try to step back from the, from the exquisitely local to try to see what it is that we know that is relevant. I'm using Lourdes Ortega's word relevant because applicability starts to be a, a, an uncomfortable term. What is relevant um, to, a, to a, a particular classroom? What, how can we... How, how high up can we get our drone to look down and say, we, we can get the general picture and say, yes, in all of those cases, these are some things that we can say with confidence have a, a meaningful uh, status. So even though all language teaching is local, I'm going to um, be so bold as to suggest that there are some generalizations that we've drawn from research in a variety of contexts that will be relevant in a great uh, number of different contexts. Now, um, yes, and I, I tip my hat to the idea that there are convergent concerns across divergent contexts. Um, the, the contexts are different, and I, I, I heard uh, Tina Hickey say this morning, and I completely agree, um, that, there, that success is measured differently in different contexts, and I had, at, at some point, it, when this PowerPoint presentation was three times as long. Uh, I had a list of the kinds of variables that are different, um, you know, starting with the goals. The goals of an ESL child um, at, at, at age seven uh, in Minneapolis are different from the goals of an Anglophone child in Montreal at age seven doing French immersion. There are the expectations, maybe the goals is the wrong word, but expectations is another way of looking at it. That's one example, but there are, there are the number of variables, I mean, to go back to Clark, you can never come up with a list that touches on all the variables. Um, but there are convergent concerns and convergent responses to those concerns, even though the contexts vary greatly. So I'm going to to uh, actually take another step back in time 
to talk about um, something that I first published in 1985 called Great Expectations, Second Language Acquisition Research and Language Teaching. Um, at that time, um, I would say that second language acquisition research was still quite young, um, and uh, there was not there was very little classroom-based research at that point, uh, with the exception being French immersion uh, research. Um, and I suggested that there were <clears throat> 10 generalizations that might be useful in, not in telling people what to do, but in helping people um, establish their expectations for what's possible in the classroom. Because I think that's one of the big problems we keep having, especially as we look at policy issues, um, and, and dealing with the general public, and when Fred was talking in the symposium earlier today about what you tell the person in the airplane seat next to you about what you do, the, the expectations and the common sense responses that people give you are so ingrained um, that sometimes it's, it's good to sort of look at it and say, well, can we, can we look at these so-called facts? Um, is there anything we can say that's general enough to apply to a, a number of different situations? So, uh, this, pa this paper was published in 1985. In 2000, I was asked to sort of look at it again, so I, <clears throat> I wrote a, a, a sort of a sequel with the same 10 generalizations but with some com further commentary. And then, so today I'll, I'll talk about it uh, a little bit using that as a, as a starting point and ask whether the 10 generalizations are still uh, compatible with what we know from classroom-based research and whether they are relevant to local classroom teaching. Um, so this was the first generalization, and it looks kind of funny now. In, 19, in, in 1985, we were still in the, in the depths of the critical period um, uh, debate, um, and uh, there were those who uh, took the position that once you'd reached a certain age, you could no longer acquire language. All you could do would be to get your textbook out and study it. Um, what we understand now is that using acquire in Krashen's sense, um, that adults and adolescents, if they are placed in situations where they have access to language that they can use, that they can understand, that they will discover, even without guidance, they will discover some of the patterns, some of the language that carries the meaning that they are understanding. So it's possible to acquire some language, and in fact it's possible in certain circumstances to acquire quite a lot of language. I always say the really good news about this particular uh, point is you don't have to teach everything because people, uh, your students will get some things without, uh, without your help <clears throat> as long as they have a chance to use language in meaningful situations. We'll come back to this. Um, predictable sequences in language acquisition. There are certain things that learners are able to do before they're able to do others. There are certain kinds of errors that learners will make on their way to a developing proficiency. And each learner creates a systematic interlanguage, that is to say, a, a pattern of language that is partly unique to him or her, uh, depending on the input opportunities, depending on the L1 that the, that the learner brings to the situation. But the, what, we, what we learned in the early days of um, research on second language acquisition was that the language that learners produced wasn't just a sort of poor uh, imitation of the target language, but rather it was their own creation of the bits and pieces that they had already acquired, and they put it together in a way that allowed them to make meaning and to understand meaning. Um, but we, we got in trouble when we started thinking that acquisition would do it all, especially acquisition based purely on comprehensible input. So uh, among other uh, crit critiques of that, uh, Branta and Lister have observed that more input is not going to make a difference. Learners need to be pushed when their focus is on academic content to use target forms which are in competition with the highly accessible interlanguage forms. In other words, the interlanguage has become their language. It works for them. It will continue to work for them unless somebody comes along and finds a way to show them where, where they're falling uh, into trouble. More, more about that. Um, this is a good one. This is a good one from 1985. Older learners do not achieve native-like mastery of the second language. Of course, again, we were, we were deep in the critical period hypothesis. But the fact is that neither do most younger learners. 
And if, if, you had, if, you could, if you could convince people of one thing, I guess, it would be that starting young is no guarantee. Starting young is a benefit in certain situations. In other situations, it does not advance you any further toward the, long, the long-term goal. In, in, in educational situations, an early start is sometimes just a kind of holding pattern. Uh, that doesn't really take you anywhere until you get old enough to start using some of your more mature cognitive resources. And it, it's all to do with the opportunities. It's all to do with the circumstances. It's one of the areas where continuing research, especially research in the classroom, has done a great deal to refine our understanding of SLA. The belief that age itself is the defining and determining factor in successful language learning and that there's some kind of simple negative correlation between success and the age at which you began learning has been completely debunked. There just isn't any, you just, it just isn't true. And age is a factor, and other factors that are associated with age can be seen to influence learning outcomes, but overwhelmingly, they're more likely to have to do with opportunities to learn rather than with uh, ability to learn. And I, I, th that's probably as controversial as it gets, because so many people are convinced otherwise. But there are many successful language learners who start late, and there are many unsuccessful language learners who started early. And age is not the simple, it, it's not, I don't have time to go into all of that, but maybe in the question period we'll, we'll talk about that some more. <clears throat> and indeed, those of you who came to my workshop on Thursday will know that, in my view, for most learners, the greatest impediment to success in language learning is the amount of time devoted to the task. And that's part of why older learners are seen to have less success. Older learners rarely have the gift of time that younger learners have. Older learners have to go to work. Older learners have to pay the bills. Older learners have to take care of their children and do other things. Uh, younger learners sometimes have the benefit of many more hours of um, exposure to the language and opportunities to use the language. And um, again, to, to, I mean, to go to repeat one, just one line from the workshop on Thursday, it's not the case, I'm not at all saying that uh, there is a direct correlation between the time you spend and the outcomes um, because the quality of the exposure and the quality of the instruction that you have during those hours but when you start to do the numbers, um, it turns out that the, the, the numbers are shockingly small, even uh, in situations where we think of um, learners having a great deal of time. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, uh, I, I said in 1985, and I'm so embarrassed that I said this, um, Practice does not make perfect. I thought that was kind of clever. But, that's, but the reason I said it in 1985 was because I was just coming off of audiolingual instruction. And I, we were just beating that beast back uh, and starting in with communicative language teaching. So practice meant rote drill. Um, so I thought I was clever, but it, was, it, was, it, is, it is a bad thing to say. It's true if practice is just decontextualized drill, but practice leads to learning if we practice enough back to the time factor, practice the right things, and practice in a variety of contexts. And when I say a variety of con well, practice enough, OK, practice enough. Children, before they ever start school, are probably exposed conservatively to 15 to 20,000 hours of language input, conservatively. Um, students who have early immersion opportunities, depending on exactly when they start, whether it's 100%, whatever, you can count that they get roughly 5,000 hours of exposure spread over several years, and that's a lot. But those, they, all of those 5,000 hours don't get used, um, uh, don't get filled with language learning activities. And of course, foreign language instruction is the, is the um, orphan child. Um, and in many contexts, in most of the world, in fact, foreign language learning means a few hundred hours a year. And then we say, um, they, they, well, they've been studying for 15 years and they still don't speak. Well, you know, you add up, you do the numbers, as they say. Um, and in fact, even when we think about the time that children spend in school, um, it, it's, it's not as much as we think. That this, is, this is to go back to the point 
um, that Tina was making this morning um, and that others have made in the course of the, of the conference, the, the absolute importance of making sure that whatever students learn in class prepares them to continue learning when they leave the classroom, whether that continuation of learning is watching a YouTube video that's in the target language or, or having a pen pal somewhere, I mean an audio or an electronic uh, pen pal. Um, but if, given the amount of, of a life that children spend in school, even if they're in immersion, even if they're in full day um, language programs, there's a whole lot of life that doesn't have that target language in it. Um, and so if we're dealing with a foreign language situation, um, we have to find ways to, to um, get that 53% to make a contribution to the, um, to the learning uh, development. Um, Practice in a variety of contexts. Um, uh, there are pedagogical reasons to, to want learners to practice in a variety of contexts. Um, for one thing, just to keep it interesting instead of always doing the same thing. Um, also to respond to learners with different backgrounds or different learning preferences and different abilities. Um, but there are also um, reasons from from our human cognition, uh, suggesting that we need um, to practice what we want to get better at, to use Robert de Keyser's term. We, um, we, we, we get better at what we practice, and if what we practice is in a narrow um, framework, let's say, of the teacher asks you a question, and you answer, and the teacher tells you if you got it right or not, um, you'll get pretty good at answering questions in that kind of situation, but you, you need to have a variety of things, and we'll come and talk some more about that in, as we go. Um, transfer appropriate processing, I will say in, in two sentences, as somebody suggested yesterday, two sentences. Um, it simply means that we remember things better if we're back in the situation that we were in, using the same kind of processes that we were using when uh, we learned it in the first place. So th this, th that is that it's that kind of transfer. It's the it's the um, it's learning something in a situation where you're likely to be able to to need to use it later. Um, that's all I'm going to have time to say about that. Okay. <laughs> um, but the, this this was a again hilarious. Um, who who knew? Knowing a language rule does not mean one will be able to use it in communicative interaction. Um, but I suppose an interesting what's interesting about this generalization. Um, 30 years later, yeah, 30 years later, um, is that, I mean, everybody knows this. People knew it 30 years ago. It's not, that was certainly not anything new. But what's, what's interesting about this one, I think, is the question of whether there are rules, whether rules exist in, in language acquisition. And that's, that's a whole discussion that we clearly don't have time for today. But the more we understand about what language learning is, the more we realize that um, learning rules um, metalinguistic rules or declarative, uh, developing declarative knowledge is, is a fraction of what real language learning is. Um, it's, it's, almost n it's almost non-existent for native speakers of a language. Don't ask them the rules. Um, but it's also a limited factor in second language learning, not an, not, but, but it's a crucial one. It's a, it may be small, but it's crucial. And um, we'll don't have time for more. Okay, so knowing a language rule does not mean that one will be able to use it, but the opposite is also true. People use language all the time for which they have absolutely no idea what the rule are. They just know that's what it sounds, that sounds like that, that's what it's supposed to sound like, and I'm gonna come to, I'm gonna hurry a lot. Isolated error correction. We've done so much good research on error correction, um, and we've learned that one size does not fit all, to use, um, to quote Ahlem Amar's uh, paper, um, we know that for some people, uh, for some environments, and I, I was saying to Roy the other day, and I, I'll say it in public now, is that okay if I say it in public? Um, that the mark of a scientist is that a scientist looks at the facts, the data, and says, gee, I thought it was this, but look at there, it's that. Roy, who, is, who made a reputation on the problem with recast in French immersion, where the focus was on content, and, and the recasts were flying right over the students' heads, 
And Roy, Roy and Layla wrote about that in compelling ways, convincing us that we needed at least, and this is what they really said, even in spite of what other people said they said, this is what they really said, you need to use a variety of feedback techniques. Don't just use recast, use other techniques as well. Um, because in this situation, recasts aren't working very well. But then when he saw the recasts used in a Japanese immersion program where there was a lot more focus on language in the general uh, teaching approach, it turned out that recasts work pretty well. Recasts work pretty well for adult language learners who are highly focused on language. So there are other contexts where it works. So um, we isolated explicit error correction is usually ineffective, but sustained, targeted, clear feedback on error is an essential part of language acquisition, and it's something that we need to work on doing better uh, in all sorts of classrooms. Um, again, the learner's task is enormous because language is enormously complex. I should have just said the learner's task is enormous, period. Um, just let it go. Um, <laughs> learner's ability, this, this is where it gets important for what we're talking about in, in immersion. Learner's ability to understand language in a meaningful context exceeds their ability to comprehend decontextualized language and to produce language of comparable complexity and accuracy. That is very wordy. I think it's even been edited. Um, but it's, it's the obvious fact that we usually focus on meaning, and when we focus on meaning, we can get the meaning even if we don't know how the language made the meaning. And that's what a lot of students in immersion are clearly doing all the time. They're sort of getting the idea, sometimes they're getting the idea quite well, but they're not getting the language that made the meaning because they can't do both at the same time. They're paying attention to the, they're not, he, he's, he's not paying attention, to the chemi chemistry teacher's uh, activity. What he's doing is thinking about the form he's gonna put in, the, uh, in his science report when he writes the, the past tense, um, but he's not doing both at the same time. Um, so that, that, that brings me to um, the question of where we get the content and language balance, which is, of course, has been very much in, in conversation, the integration of content and language. Um, and how we do that and how we help learners to discover what it is that they need to learn um, in the content lessons about the language as well as the content. And I, I'm going to share with you something that I have shared with uh, a number of teachers in a whole great variety of contexts. It's research that, that, is, um, that started uh, uh, as research on vocabulary um, it is the research of Paul Nation, whom some of you would know because of his research on vocabulary. But he has um, proposed that for language teaching, there are four necessary strands that must be present in every language course. And you can tell by my silly list of generalizations that I, I, I'm a simple person. I like to simplify things. And when I saw this article by Paul Nation, which was published first in 2007 as a, as a, a brief uh, online article, I felt it was one of those, another one of those epiphanies, like, wow, where's that been all my life? Because it's, it's a way of looking at language teaching, whether you're looking at a class, a, a, a plan that you're doing for a lesson, whether you're looking at a curriculum for a period of time, whether you're looking at um, a, 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 a year of instruction, um, it's a way of asking yourself, do they have every, do, do my students get everything they need? And it sounds slightly preposterous, but I'm convinced that it is a very good way of standing back from what you're doing and asking yourself, are all four strands present and are they present in sufficient quantity? Um, because in, in Nation's view, they should all be there. His research was done with vocabulary, as I say, but I'm convinced that his uh, proposal is compatible with everything I know about second language acquisition research. So I'll tell you what the four strands are. Meaning-focused input. So whether you're a kindergarten teacher reading a story, whether you are an adolescent having a, a conversation with your peers in a, in a uh, collaborative um, uh, work ac activity, whether you're listening to a, a tape, whether you're reading a book, if you are understanding what, what's coming in, if what you're hearing and reading 
includes a little bit that you don't understand. Think Krashen's I plus one, if you want. Um, so that it's, it's understandable, it's manageable, it's not, not so stressful that you have to keep stopping and looking up everything. But you're getting the meaning, but it also co contains some new elements that you haven't mastered yet. That's what meaning-focused input is, and you need a lot of it to get things moving. You also need, I believe I've heard it said, meaning-focused output. Again, think Swain's output hypothesis. It's all very well to get the general idea, but suppose you need to tell somebody else what you found out, then you need meaning-focused output. You need to be able to put it in your own words. And meaning-focused output is meant to communicate something. It's not practice of forms just for their say own sake. It's actually telling somebody something or writing somebody something. Meaning-focused output. Then there's language-focused learning. That's where you, you actually stop, whether you stop for a minute, a, a short lesson, um, whether, whether you're doing this as, whether we're talking about reactive focus on form where, where something has come up in the class and you're trying to help students overcome a difficulty, or whether we're talking about the kind of proactive planning that Laurent Camerata has been doing such wonderful work on, where you say to yourself, what do the students need? What's the language that they need? As a teacher, you're saying, I've got to give them the language that they need. And the most important thing about language-focused learning, this strand, is that anything you're learning in that strand has to be reinforced and used in the meaning-focused input, meaning-focused output phases. We, we remember from back in the bad old days, I'm sure it doesn't happen anymore, that in the language arts class, they're talking about, I don't know, um, well, that's not, I won't even know. I don't know what they're talking about over there. But it's nothing to do with what they're doing in the math class or the science class or the history class. It's, it's a lack of coordination, but it's also a lack of understanding um, of what it means to say focus on language. You don't focus on language for its own sake. You focus on language for its use so that you can use it in the meaning-focused parts of your um, instruction. And uh, I always I, I like the idea that for a great deal of their content-based instruction, students look right through language. The language is its as if it were not there. It's a, it's a clear window. Um, and sometimes we have to stop and say, no, don't look, at, don't look at the content. Look at the language that's making the, the content, making it comprehensible to you. Look at the language that you still don't understand or that you still can't produce. And then go back to focusing on the content. So it's a, it's a balance. It's a counterbalance. It's a... It's an approach that um, requires language-focused learning and meaning-focused learning. Remember, um, so far I've only told you about three strands. Two of them are meaning-focused, and one of them is language-focused, so we have to have one more strand. I promised you four. Um, and it has to be me it's going to be meaning-focused. And if I didn't have one minute, or now 45 seconds, I would ask you to tell me what you think it's going to be. But since I have only 45 seconds, um, it's fluency development. Fluency development. Fluency development. Not fluency meaning you can just jabber away and make all sorts of mistakes and just talk easily and you don't care. That's what some people call fluency. That's not what I'm talking about. It's not what Paul Nation is talking about. We're talking about doing something, doing it well, with some scaffolding, some structure, some opportunity to do it um, so that you get it right, and then doing it again and again and under some time pressure and doing it again and again until it's become automatic, at which point you don't have to think about it anymore and you can focus your attention on something else. And fluency doesn't refer to speaking only. It refers to reading. It refers to writing. It refers to listening. It refers to understanding and reading as well as to language production. Um, the, the, the challenge, of course, is weaving all those strands together, um, finding the, um, the, the right balance of meaning-focused input, meaning-focused output, language-focused learning, and fluency development. Nation says they should all be there in equal parts. That's a real challenge if you're doing content-based language teaching, but I kind of think it's a possibility, and I would, I would, I would love to entertain um, research proposals that would look at that at, at, at um, that possibility. 
So those generalizations from SLA research can guide our expectations, but the local conditions of a particular classroom certainly affect the way things are, um, uh, the, the way they are experienced. Um, I was go I'm going to tell you one quick uh, story, but you'll have to listen carefully because it involves um, that thing that English does where this, you say the same thing, but a slight difference of emphasis on one of the words changes everything. And here's the story. Um, my husband's uh, parents loved to go to Portugal. And in their retirement years, they would go almost every year and spend several weeks, sometimes several months. But after a while, they, as they were getting older, they said, you know, we probably shouldn't do this anymore because it's, it's risky for us to be traveling. So this is going to be our last trip. So we said, oh, too bad. That's sad. I mean, OK, but we understand. Well, the next year, they said, OK, we're going to go to Portugal in April. And, and we said, what? You said that was going to be your last trip. Yeah, that was our last trip. Now we're planning the next one. <laughs> so, so sometimes I keep telling people, I tell people that I'm, I'm going to retire now. I'm really going to retire and that this is going to be my last conference, OK? Now, that would be a wonderful way for me to end, I must say. This, this conference has, in a way, brought me back to where I started. And so I'm, I, it would be fine um, if this were my last conference, because I could also be thinking about what you will be doing at your next conference. And one thing I know for sure um, is that nothing ever becomes real until it's experienced. And so anything that we say about the research findings can only become real to you when you have lived it. And so I, I, I look forward to hearing more wonderful research from you, more wonderful results from your teaching and your professional development activities. And uh, maybe I'll come back and just listen next year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Patsy. That was wonderful. What a wonderful way to close the conference with one of the co-authors of How Languages Are Learned <laughs> to share your knowledge with us. And fortunately, we have some... Uh, sorry, that... <clears throat> fortunately... <laughs> that's what I said. I just wasn't sure it sounded like that. <laughs> fortunately, we have time for questions. And um, Ophelia said she would run around with the mic, but I don't mind doing it, Ophelia. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to field the questions, and Ophelia is going to get the exercise. <laughs> this is what happens when you talk at people for 45 minutes, I mean, although you've, you've been very good at asking questions. <laughs> Um, I was wondering what your opinions are on the new research related to translanguaging. What do you mean by translanguaging? <laughs> I just went to the symposium, so I know that's a legitimate question. <laughs> um, in relation to what, would you, th in relation to early childhood education and classroom contacts, and even do you feel like this is um, a new field of research, or is this something we've been talking about for a long time? Oh, that's an interesting way of putting it. That's a very interesting way of putting it. If, if, if by translanguaging we mean taking account of the other languages that a learner speaks as we plan our lessons and react to learners' uh, attempts to uh, communicate, then yes, we've been doing that for a long time. Um, uh, I think that what's th that there is new uh, in the uh, the meaning of translanguaging, and I think where it uh, is most um, powerfully uh, demonstrated is in situations of minority language learning, where um, minority language learners are are given the power to um, to use the languages that they bring with them to the classroom, uh, and to rec and to be and to come to understand to come to believe that those languages have value. Um, not just at home, but also in the, in the classroom. That's... <laughs> oh, Fred. Oh, Fred. Fred's good at I, I asking questions. Have. Well, 
Yes, you have convinced us. <laughs> <laughs> but if you had to, in the context of your reviewing your 10 great, great expectations, <laughs> uh, is there something, and maybe you did this, but uh, maybe I'll just push it a bit. Yeah. Is there something totally brand new you would add oh. that you think that, was, it, that is really significant? I mean, not a detail, but... What a, a wonderful question. And I think I alluded to it, <clears throat> but I didn't elaborate on it. Um, and, and that is a, a, a better understanding of what language is. I think in 1985, language was kind of vocabulary, grammar, pronunciation. I mean, even, uh, e even pragmatics was just barely peeking in the door. So now we understand language much more broadly. And we also understand language acquisition much more broadly. Um, we, we certainly have got both, both cognitive research and sociocultural research that tell us uh, much more about how languages are learned than we, than we knew 30 years ago. I, I, I do think that some of, these, some of these generalizations can be stretched, but I think what we mean within them, the words that, that we used, don't mean the same thing to us anymore. I guess that's what I would say. Language is not what language was 30 years ago. Language is much, much richer. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. <laughs>don't get the kind of interaction and um, modified input that makes it possible to, to begin to grasp language and then to build on what you already know. So um, uh, certainly uh, older learners who are getting their language uh, exposure in a classroom have a very limited opportunity to learn the range of things that they need to know. But even adults out in the community um, sometimes don't get the kind of um, opportunities to interact with other speakers. Um, but even in the, in the classroom, we talk about, uh, we, one of the things that um, we talk a lot about is what kind of language students in a classroom learn, whether it's in immersion or in some other kinds of classrooms. And we recognize that sometimes they have difficulty, of course, learning academic language. Um, and, uh, but they also have difficulty learning um, social language because they don't have, the, in, in a one-way immersion situation, for example, they don't have the peers with whom they, from whom they can learn some of the uh, age-appropriate uh, casual language. But of course, even in dual immersion, sometimes the, the sociocultural situation um, results in learners not having the opportunity to learn because somebody switches to English as soon as they walk in the door, as uh, Tina was saying. So um, opportunities to learn can cover a whole range of things, but it's everything from just literal amounts of time to the kinds of interactions that make learning possible. Is that okay, Fred? <laughs> <laughs> yes. This may not have an answer. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled that there are almost a thousand people here. But in the vast picture of immersion teachers, you know, we're, we're one tiny little drop. And, and what can we do as an organization or as an educational public to really help with the prof professional development of our immersion teachers? What a wonderful, heartfelt question. Um, and of course, I don't have an answer, as you, as you quite rightly suggested. But I think we are seeing the kind of progress that we've seen in, let's say, the past five years um, towards professional development, towards getting um, teachers to understand what their task really is. Um, I, I think we've seen more progress in the past few years than we had seen in, in quite a few years prior to that. It's certainly in the US, certainly in the US. Um, I think the kinds of things that, that are going into professional development, both in-service and pre-service development, are so much richer now than they, than they used to be for the teachers themselves. 
But for the, the real hard piece is convincing policymakers and politicians, not mentioning any names, um, that, that this, is a, this is a resource, of, uh, that languages are one of our most precious uh, resources, and that having people who work with languages and develop uh, language skills um, make contributions at every level, uh, can make contributions if they are properly supported and properly trained, can make contributions from everything from cognitive development to economic opportunity, um, as, as we have certainly heard at this conference. So we, we just have to keep voting, and we have to keep talking, and then we have to keep doing uh, you know, good research and professional development. Um, but it's, it's not something that will happen fast. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a better answer. Thank you, Patsy. <laughs> it's, thank you for your plenary. Please join me in thanking Patsy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs>